everyone. Thank you for joining us today at our virtual reality naloxone training simulation webinar. As many of you know, we are thrilled to partner with Walmart to present this unique virtual reality training experience. We initially launched the simulation back in February 2020 at CACA's National Leadership Forum. We then engaged with many of our amazing coalitions to learn how communities can host events using this technology. We had amazing initial feedback, including how to use this VR tool as a standalone awareness event, create a training around it, or add it to trainings that are already being held. To date, we've held 10 virtual screening events, engaging more than 1,000 participants, and we look forward to hosting another 10 more events this coming year and engaging in countless new participants. Today, we are thankful for you, our amazing CACA members and guests, and we are specifically today thankful to our good friends and tonight's co-host, Dr. Michelle Geiser, Julie Honeycutt, and the team at Hope Coalition of Henderson County. I'm also excited to roll out today's event in conjunction with Hope Coalition and Henderson County Public Schools' We Are Hope Week. Since 2015, the school student government organization and leaders have organized the campaign in partnership with Hope Coalition and a growing number of supporting community agencies. Each year, the school students' governments plan awareness activities to stress the importance of remaining substance-free, and high school leaders collaborate with their middle school student leaders to organize activities. This year, student leaders plan to use morning announcements and videos to share information with their classmates, including local and national data on substance misuse, as well as resources and strategies for managing social issues like peer pressure. We'll hear more about this campaign from Dr. Geyser in just a few minutes. Before I kick this off to hear from our esteemed group of speakers, I wanna let everyone know the goals for today. First, we will hear from a wonderful group of speakers here in Western North Carolina who are working every day to save lives. We are honored for them to be part of this event. Then, along with our Walmart team, we will view a virtual reality simulation that demonstrates a few different scenarios on how to recognize when an overdose is happening and how to administer naloxone. Lastly, we would love your valuable input while learning from you all in attendance today how you would use this virtual reality format in your communities. From these events, we plan to learn how to roll out this technology nationally and what resources we need to accompany this goal. So again, we want your input. After we hear from our speakers and see the simulation, we'll have a few minutes for some guided Q&A. I'll ask a few questions at the end of the hour, and if we'd please type your answers into the chat, we would appreciate your input. Additionally, in the weeks to come, we will reach out to you all as a group to get more input from you as well. And now on to our speakers. First, we will start with CACA's president and CEO and my boss, General Barry Alprice. After a decorated and distinguished 31 year career in the United States Army, General Price joined us at CACA nearly five years ago as our Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer. In September of 2020, he was named CACA's third ever President and CEO, and we are thrilled to have him as our leader. General Price is a recipient of numerous military awards and decorations, including the Distinguished Service Medal, Defense Superior Service Medal, and the Bronze Star Medal. General Price's impact on our nation's armed forces is felt to this day. General Price, thank you for your service to our nation and now your service to our communities. I turn it over to you. Thank you for that introduction, Rico. Um, our co-host, uh, co Hope Coalition, has been a great advocate and ally for CATCA for many years. And it's an honor to be on with them and other leaders from the great state of North Carolina. I'm truly excited about our partnership with Walmart, who has developed a virtual reality tool to develop to deliver a powerful ex experiential element to naloxone and over, uh, overdose reversal training. It has never been more important to know how to save a life, and everyone on this webinar is at the forefront of efforts in your community. We are now entering a hopeful and promising stage in our country. We are boosted 
we're vaccinated and committed to having life return to normal. We must use this opportunity to create innovative and groundbreaking strategies to address substance use and abuse. Today's webinar is a great example of that. CATCA knows that prevention of substance use and misuse before it starts is the most cost-efficient and effective way to reduce substance misuse. And prevention has become more important than ever. Recently, the CDC reported that 104,288 drug overdose deaths occurred in the United States in the 12 months ending September 2021. That's the largest number uh, of a 12 month period ever recorded. It's estimated that the number may reach as high as 140,000 when they assess data from December 2019 to December 20 of 2020. To put that number in perspective, that would be the seventh largest city in North Carolina. Put another way, imagine that every person on every plane at Charlotte's Douglas International Airport during any 12 hour span would have died from overdose death. This is tragic. And we have to do our level best to right this ship. As life returns to normal, it's important to work together as one, one nation, one goal, one CATCA. One CATCA is a call to action. It signals that the participants within this movement must unite and come together as one if we are to win. Together we are stronger. And as we train substance use and misuse prevention to coalitions every day of the year, all across the world, we know that without the buy-in of local leaders like you, this won't work. The conversation being held today on this webinar is not a unique one. Our partners at the Drug Enforcement Administration recently launched their One Pill Can Kill campaign, which aims to raise awareness about fentanyl-laced pills that are killing so many fellow Americans. Let it be known that if you did not receive your medication from a licensed pharmacist, do not take it. We have seen that one pill laced with fentanyl can do, and we do not need to see any more lives lost needlessly. Keep up the great work that you're doing. I look forward to seeing you in person the next time we are all together. Thank you for having me on today. And Reiko, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you so much, General Price. Uh, it was great to hear from you as always, and we really appreciate your time. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Michelle Geiser. Dr. Geiser holds a doctorate in education and is a trauma specialized mental health professional who serves as the program director for Hope Coalition. Michelle works with children, adolescents and families to regain their personal power through education, prevention, advocacy and recovery. Michelle believes that empowered people build strong communities. She works to provide and sustain services to the community as a whole in order to build resilience. She's a national board certified counselor, a licensed clinical mental health counseling associate, a licensed substance abuse counsel associate, and a licensed school counselor. Michelle also holds a certificate of nonprofit management from Duke University. Dr. Geiser, thank you for being our co-host today and I turn it to you. Good evening, I'm Dr. Geiser, and I am the program director for the HOPE Coalition. We are so grateful to CADCA and Walmart for this opportunity to partner and to share some additional information with the community on our services, on the services of the partners uh, of HOPE Coalition, and really on how we can all come together to help save the lives of individuals in our community. Hope Coalition came into formation in 2013. It was a response to the community health assessment and was created first as Hope RX as the prescription for hope for Henderson County. Hope Coalition's mission has been dedicated to preventing substance use among youth and substance misuse among adults. We focused on long-term recovery for anyone impacted by alcohol, or drug addiction. We're a grassroots effort 
that was initiated by the Partnership for Health. We accomplished our tasks by building capacity in the community and hoping to create sustainable plans that will benefit Henderson County for years to come. A part of the sustainability that we're looking for now in this partnership is ensuring that all of our partners, all of our community members can engage in training and be comfortable carrying the life-saving tool of naloxone that can be used to help those who are suffering from an overdose in our community. Hope Coalition partners with Henderson County in a lot of different ways to work on prevention, education, advocacy, and recovery. And some of the ways you might see us in the community is participating with law enforcement in drug take back events or running media campaigns around prevention and recovery. Uh, this week, you'll see us in the schools providing our We Are Hope Week campaign, which is a prevention focus prior to spring break in which we engage all of Henderson County middle and high school students and support them in signing banners to pledge to remain substance free throughout spring break. The banners that they're signing will be hung at the historic courthouse at high noon on Friday, March 11th. We will be graced by many of our community members speaking to our youth to congratulate them on their efforts and on their ongoing prevention work within the middle and high schools. We encourage any of you to come and support the students in this event. And again, that is Friday at noon at the historic courthouse. Hope Coalition has also been engaged in the Lock Your Meds campaign, helping parents and caregivers to find ways to responsibly lock up medications, helping them to reduce access for youth in their home. Hope Coalition places a strong emphasis on the youth in our area and hope to continue to provide education and prevention practices that will help to improve health outcomes for our youth, their families, and the community members in Henderson County. We're so grateful that you're here and hope that you enjoy all the speakers that we've lined up and stay for the training in the end brought to you by Walmart. Uh, next, we will hear from Dr. Shuchin Shukla. Dr. Shukla was born and raised in New Orleans. He completed medical school and public health school at Tulane University and completed a residency in family medicine at Montefiore Medical Center in the Bronx. He worked in the South Bronx for five years following residency, providing primary care for adults and children, as well as for adults living with HIV. He served as medical director for Montefiore Project Inspire, a primary care-based hepatitis C treatment program. He then moved with his family to Asheville, North Carolina, where he had been a physician at Western North Carolina Community Health Services until joining the Mountain Area Health Education Center as faculty physician and opioid crisis educator. He's an associate clinical professor of medicine in the Department of Family Medicine at the School of Medicine, University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. We are so excited to hear from you tonight, Dr. Shukla. Hi. My name is Suchin Shukla. I'm a family medicine and addiction medicine physician here at Mountain Area Health Education Center in Asheville, North Carolina. I have focused my clinical work for the past 10 years on HIV, hepatitis C, addiction, criminal justice involved individuals, and unhoused individuals. Unfortunately, over the last several decades, these intertwined problems have worsened. For many years in a row, the life expectancy of the average American has decreased after 40 years of consistent increases. This is due to addiction and drug overdose, which continues to be the top cause of death for Americans under age 50, followed by suicide. To me, this is unconscionable that in one of the most developed nations in the world, my neighbors are dying from preventable and treatable conditions. And the problem is worsening. The CDC has noted that in the recent 12 month period, 100,000 Americans died of overdose, the highest in American history. And we are not at the peak yet, unfortunately. While the root causes are complex, there is a key thread here, shame and stigma. Addiction and overdose, homelessness, criminal justice involvement, all are stigmatized topics where getting help is impeded by numerous interconnected barriers, often man-made. While disentangling and addressing the upstream factors will take coordinated, sustainable, long-term st strategies, especially since the root causes revolve around trauma and disenfranchisement, there are straightforward solutions we can implement right now. 
And we are doing this right now here at Mayheck in Asheville, more broadly in Western North Carolina and statewide. So I'd like to share our experience with you, hopefully to convince you that you too can create solutions and build hope in your communities as well. At Mayheck, we provide a variety of outpatient clinical services, including primary care, prenatal and women's health, and psychiatry services. This includes integrated behavioral health services, peer support, and HIV and hepatitis C treatment. Most importantly, integrated into all of those services, we provide evidence-based FDA-approved medication for opioid use disorder, otherwise known as MAT. These medications save lives, period. Specifically, buprenorphine is a medication that can be prescribed by anyone with a DEA license and some training, and it can help stabilize the brains and lives of people who are suffering from opioid addiction. It is safe and unlikely to, to be misused due to its unique pharmacology. It literally reduces the risk of death by up to 70%. Quite immediately, and per the National Institute for Drug Addiction, for every dollar spent on evidence-based addiction treatment, four to seven dollars are saved in non-healthcare costs alone. This includes the cost of crimes like theft and criminal justice system costs like jails and judges. If you add in the dollars saved from heart valve infections and HIV and other healthcare costs, you save eight to ten dollars per dollar spent on treatment. So this is a no-brainer, but unfortunately barriers remain. While one in ten Americans over age 12 suffer with addiction, only one out of ten of those individuals can access treatment. This is due to a lack of affordable insurance, lack of Medicaid expansion in some states. Additionally, not enough prescribers have been trained on this life-saving treatment and support systems to promote recovery, like stable housing, living wage jobs, and behavioral health services are not in place. These barriers are particularly acute for rural communities, people of color, indigenous communities, pregnant and parenting women, criminal justice involved individuals, and the almost 30 million Americans living without insurance. So instead of getting cheap and effective treatment from clinics, many folks suffering with addiction wind up in jails, prisons, ambulances, and emergency rooms, all of which are more expensive and more dehumanizing ways of addressing a treatable medical condition. All of these services we provide at Mayhek for opioid use disorder and other substance use disorders, we do through the lens of harm reduction. What is harm reduction? It means meeting people where they are at and acknowledging that we cannot eliminate all risk for every person, but surely we can at least reduce the risk and make life safer. Harm reduction is seat belts and speeding limits on highways. It's bike helmets and lifeguards. Harm reduction is condoms. And when it comes to addiction, harm reduction is naloxone in the hands of as many people as possible, free and accessible, especially with addiction, uh, for people with addiction and their families, and for people leaving jails and prisons and their families. It is a medication that is safe and can save the life of a person experiencing an opioid overdose, and it can be administered by anyone with relatively simple training. Research shows that with wide community access, it reduces overdose rates and ER visits without increasing substance use. Research also shows that most of the life-saving that happens from naloxone comes from other people who use drugs. So in Mayhek, we work with a variety of community partners to ensure our patients have access to this lifeline. Home reduction also means addressing stigma and shame, which our amazing peer support specialists do in their engagement with patients no matter where they are on the recovery spectrum. What else can we do to address the barriers to improving the health and quality of life for our communities? At Mayek, we have recognized that addiction and its treatment cannot be siloed from other social spheres. So we work closely with local jails to improve linkage after incarceration to MAT services, which can reduce the risk of criminal activity, reincarceration, probation violation, and, and of course, overdose death. We work closely with EMS colleagues to link patients to MAT services as soon as possible after a non-fatal overdose. We work with our homeless service providers to ensure unhoused individuals with addiction get the appropriate care. We work with medical residency training programs across the state to ensure the next generation of doctors are trained in the solutions to this increasingly dire overdose crisis. And we also work with the current generation of doctors, nurse practitioners, and other prescribers in federally qualified health centers and county health departments, those who are already caring for the underserved and marginalized to ensure these providers also have the training and technical assistance they need to expand MAT capacity and utilize the harm reduction approach. Feels like my amazing colleagues here at Mayak are doing so much, just like my amazing colleagues around the state and around the country. I'm so proud of the approach that is continuing to evolve at federal and state levels. But the problem grows faster than our efforts, so it will take all of us to address it because all of us are affected by the ongoing national overdose crisis, whether we know it or not. It might be family members who have died or who have affected the finances of other loved ones. 
might be a parent lost to incarceration, thus putting their children at risk for future addiction themselves due to this trauma. It might be the changes in public safety in our communities as mental health crises and addiction are increasingly evident in our parks and downtowns. The evidence is everywhere, but luckily the tools we have work. And besides MAT, which requires a prescribing license, we have naloxone, which should be the new CPR, taught to everyone, accessible everywhere, with cost never being a barrier. And we have to talk about these problems in all realms of life and public uh, discourse with empathy and love, without judgment, but with pragmatism and coordination and funding to eliminate the stigma and shame of this medical disease that can affect anyone. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shukla. We are so fortunate to learn from your experience um, about the specific and actionable ways that we can improve, ser improve services for our fellow community members. We really appreciate your remarks. We're now gonna turn to hear from Chief Blair Myhand. Chief Myhand joined the US Army in 1987 and continued to serve in the North Carolina Army National Guard until 2011. His service includes two combat tours to Afghanistan and Iraq, and he was awarded the Bronze Star Medal for his service in Afghanistan. His law enforcement career began in 1994 with the Metropolitan Police Department in Washington, DC, where he worked until 2005. After moving to North Carolina, he was hired by the Apex Police Department. He was selected as Chief of Police for the Clayton Police Department in May, 2017, and became the Chief of Police for the Hendersonville Police Department in February, 2021. Chief Myhan serves on the executive boards for the North Carolina FBI National Academy Association and the North Carolina Association of Chiefs of Police. He holds a graduate certificate in criminal justice education from the University of Virginia and a master's of public administration from Villanova to University. We'll now hear from Chief Myhan, who will talk to us about how he is able to save lives by getting all of his officers access to naloxone. From a personal standpoint, 12 years ago, my youngest sister uh, died from a, a drug overdose. And so she was a pretty long time addict. And, um, and of course, you know, she, she died using you know, pretty heavy narcotics. And so uh, I didn't really know about naloxone and never heard of it back then. And, uh, and it was really a couple of years after that that I started hearing about uh, naloxone and what it can do to, to sort of uh, keep people from overdosing. So, but he, even as a, you know, as a police officer, I was still a little bit reluctant to, to take on the role of, of administering medication to someone, even though I I'd had a personal experience with it. Uh, but a lot of cops, you know, that I talked to didn't want to do it. They were thinking, hey, this is, you know, more than we should be asked to do. And so, you know, there was some really, I think, some reluctance from, from law enforcement in the early days of, of naloxone becoming pretty readily available to folks. Um, and I was actually in a meeting with David Roush, who was the then Knoxville police chief, and he talked about the reason that they use naloxone, or one of the main reasons they used it was because it could help uh, an officer who might be exposed to fentanyl or, or, or something in the course of their duties, uh, it could keep them from overdosing. And so when, I, when he explained it to me that way, it made a lot of sense. And it was easy for me to, to you know, defend to my staff of why we were going to uh, start using naloxone and carrying naloxone. And, you know, thankfully, I can say that, you know, in the past, I don't know, six or seven years since that, uh, since that time, I've not seen an instance where we have had to give an officer Narcan, thankfully, um, but there have been numerous instances where we've had to give uh, individuals Narcan. And so, you know, what I would say to the, the folks that would, uh, you know, the critics of police officers or even EMS giving, uh, you know, and I'll use the, you know, the common term, the drug addict um, naloxone and reviving them from, from an overdose is, you know, I, I, I understand that, you know, some people will 
are addicts and they will always be addicts and they'll, and they'll never recover from that much like my sister did. Um, but you never know when that one person will one day, you know, decide that they're going to uh, turn away from those and, and get in recovery and, and actually do something productive with their lives. And so, um, you know, I think in, in law enforcement, our number one priority is the preservation of life. And uh, we may not, may not have always had a good understanding of that or appreciation of that, but I think that's a growing trend to, to reinforce that in our profession. And so this is part of that. And it's not my position to uh, make judgment on why someone is uh, in a position you know, that, that is overdosing. It's just the fact that they are, and I'm there and I'm equipped uh, to be able to do something about it. And, and I should do that. And so uh, we, we carry naloxone. We make sure that, you know, we've, we've applied for a few grants and got, an, got some resupply of naloxone, but every officer has at least one naloxone kit on them. And of course we replace them if they use those, but um, you know, we're in a city. So EMS is, is generally there, you know, right about the same time we are, but you know, a couple of times a month, probably we're, we are delivering Narcan as just as the police department. And so uh, given the fact that, you know, we're, we're seeing increasing numbers of people that are overdosing on fentanyl laced drugs, um, you know, it's becoming an, an issue in all of our communities. And so, you know, we're, we're, we're not seeing so much of the prescription abuse anymore, but we're actually seeing this, uh, these drugs that are laced with fentanyl and, and, uh, and they're really causing, you know, a lot of deaths out there in, in the communities. And I know, you know, and I'm sure uh, someone who's using drugs is not intending to overdose. Uh, and so, you know, we, we are, de we are delivering Narcan in those times that we can, and we're trying to connect those people with resources to get them the help so they won't continue to reoffend. Uh, with, you know, using more uh, illicit drugs. And so uh, that's part of our duty to, the, to society. And we're going to continue to do that. I'm a, I'm a strong uh, proponent of the use of Narcan. Uh, and we will continue to carry that here at this department. And, and I'll continue to be an advocate within uh, this part of North Carolina and, and throughout the entire state for our departments to, to equip their officers with naloxone not only for a public safety uh, perspective, but also for an officer safety perspective. And uh, it's, you know, it's relatively cheap. It's easy to use and, and, uh, and to train people how to use that. And, and so, you know, we've, we've created policies around it. We've shared those with other agencies. And, um, and, and this is just something I think that law enforcement is, is, you know, we're unfortunately we're in a position in our society where we're seeing so much of this and uh and we're you know law enforcement needs to continue to to play a part and sort of preserve people's lives and, and try to get them connected with with resources and the help that they need so they can uh, recover from the drug addiction thank you for those remarks chief myhan and for your support of our local coalitions and our community and the work you and your team are doing every day also, thank you for sharing your personal story. Um, you spoke about what we're trying to achieve through these events. Uh, one is to encourage everyone to be familiar with and comfortable with administering naloxone. And another goal is to create the norm that every life is worth saving. So thank you so much for your remarks and for your work. Now we're gonna turn it over to Alice Elio, who serves Henderson County, both in schools and through the Hope Coalition. Ellis has been a registered nurse caring for children for over 40 years. 23 of those years has been in school nursing. Ellis has served as a school nurse for students in preschool all the way up to 21 years of age, seeing to their immediate health needs and in her role of public health nurse, addressing the upstream causes and future outcomes of their health. She is a member of the HOPE Coalition, linking the community responses for substance misuse with the Henderson County Public Schools nurses and the students in their schools. Alice? So primary prevention for school nursing is always a priority in our care for students. 
School nurses provide services as a critical role in public health, ensuring the academic success of students in our community, addressing students' mental, behavioral, emotional issues, including substance abuse prevention and treatment, as an underlayment to the overall health practice in keeping students safe, healthy, and ready to learn. We work alongside the other instructional personnel at school and the community, working with social workers, counselors, SROs. The school nurses address substance abuse issues in schools. We provide valuable K-12 education. They spend time in classrooms providing substance abuse prevention curriculum from Mr. Yuck to working alongside the school resource officer in fifth grade prevention classes. We continue to educate students on through high school on the dangers of prescription drug misuse and abuse. Furthermore, the school nurses assist families in recognizing the signs and symptoms of substance abuse and support and guide them in locating resources that might be needed for care, counseling and referral and treatment. We advocate for the use of alternate pain medications for students when they're injured. We know that fully one third of the high school students who experience a legitimately prescribed opioid are more likely to misuse opioids after high school due to its effect on the developing brain. Compound this legal use leading to misuse with the rising mental health issues and the risk-taking behavior of teenagers. And the result is at least one in eight teenagers abusing an illicit substance in the last year. Admittedly, while marijuana is the leading substance at this age, the non-medical use of prescription painkillers to obtain the high is prevalent in vaping with THC or other substances is trending. A crucial contributing factor regarding drug overdose deaths involves the current reality of substances such as marijuana or what is thought to be an innocent vape or a pill lookalike being laced with other substances such as fentanyl. This lacing has greatly heightened the stakes at hand for both our youth and any substance using adult that may be at the school at any particular point in time. School nurses advocate for safe and effective management of opioid related overdoses in schools as part of the school emergency management and response. When drug related emergencies happen, proper management of these incidents at school is vital to positive outcomes. School nurses in this role facilitate access to naloxone for quick response in the management of opioid related overdoses in the school setting. They possess the education and knowledge to identify and manage the emergency until relieved by EMS personnel and are able to follow up with the healthcare provider. Naloxone saves lives and it can be the first step towards opioid use disorder recovery. As an opioid antagonist, naloxone displaces opiates from the receptor sites in the brain and will temporarily reverse the potentially deadly respiratory depression. Hope Coalition and the Henderson County Department of Health have both contributed to the school nurse's ability to respond quickly and appropriately to an overdose at school with naloxone. With naloxone as part of the emergency protocol now, a school nurse recently identified the need for a reversal of a student. She called for the naloxone, which was then administered by the SRO while she monitored the student. A potentially life-threatening overdose was reversed and the school team is now included as part of the recovery plan as a support for that student. Naloxone saves lives. Reversal can lead to recovery. And naloxone is one essential tool used by our school nurses in keeping students safe, healthy, and ready to learn. Thank you so much, Alice, for taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you for everything you're doing for the children and families of Henderson County and what you're doing in the schools is amazing. 
um, and really trailblazing. And so we're so grateful for you to be speaking to us all about that today. Next, we have one of Hope Coalition's newest valuable additions, Jason Harris. Jason has worked in the field of addiction for over 20 years and now works for Hope Coalition as the project coordinator of the Comprehensive Opioid Stimulant and Substance Abuse Program. He received his Certified Alcohol and Drug Counselor Certification in 2014 and has since worked in addiction treatment programs. Jason is experienced in working with adults as well as adolescents and has a strong desire to serve the people of Henderson County. He has also over 10 years experience working as a missionary in Haiti. He now celebrates 22 years of maintaining recovery. Congratulations to you, Jason, and we're excited to hear from you. Hi, my name is Jason Harris. I'm a person in long-term recovery. I've been in recovery since July 4th, 2000. I'm a certified substance abuse counselor. I currently work with Hope Coalition in Hendersonville, North Carolina. Uh, as a child, I endured and witnessed a lot of traumatic events. I battled through suicidal thoughts and attempts. I struggled through depression. I eventually began using drugs, which ultimately, after years of hard use, led me to my last overdose. After my overdose, I went into a residential program, which was 12 months. The majority of that 12 months was focused on basically just getting my life back, getting rehabilitated physically, uh, emotionally, mentally, uh, getting me stable. Um, I came out of the first stint, then uh, had a few months and um, out back into my community. And then I went to another 12 month program and really just focused on getting my life back, basic life skills, work skills and ethics, a lot of discipline, getting used to a routine, a structure, getting myself uh, sensitized to the things that I've desensitized myself to over the years. When I came out of there, uh, I hung around there for some accountability. Uh, but I, I really had no outside supports that I could lean on. It immediately made me realize that there was a lack in transitional services. So as I stated before, I'm a substance abuse counselor. Um, I just, I have a, a passion and heart for, um, that just drives me to help others that are battling addiction. Um, it comes from a personal experience. You know, um, it comes from somebody that, that, People have always told from, from my immediate family to friends, to teachers, to you, you name, you name them, uh, you know, it, 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 it was always, you know, uh, you're going down the wrong path. You're not going to amount to anything. You've, you've this, this, all these, all these negative, um, these negative vibes, uh, towards me, you know, to, uh, so once, you know, once I overdosed, I started spending time with the, with the right people after my overdose and started getting the right supports around me. And people were just, people um, believed in me at the time more than I believed in myself. The thing that drives me now is who I've become, uh, who, I, who, who I've been uh, um, allowed to help. Um, in their battle of addiction and, and, um, and the trust that people have given me. You know, my boss in my last job, you know, gave me temporary custody over her daughter while she was away for four months. Um, it was just amazing. You know, that, that was like my breakthrough because I realized then that how, uh, how far I've come uh, to be able to be trusted with someone's daughter. And, um, you, you know, whereas 22 years ago, I, I wasn't trusted with $5. It's, you, you never know who you're saving. I mean, you never, you know, when you see someone as an overdose, uh, overdose whether you call 911 or whether you um, give them Narcan or whether you give them CPR or whatever, you, you have no idea um, who this person is going to become because you've saved their life. Um, and you know, I had no idea I was going to be where I'm at today, 22 years ago. And I think the person that saved me had no idea. I would love to be able to meet them uh, and, and let them know, you know, my path to where I'm at today and give them a big hug. That's what drives me today. My personal experience is what drives me today. Where I'm at today is what drives me to help others. You just have no idea. That's the message you have no idea who you're waking up you know is when you're you know that when i had that narcan and i was and i i put it up to that guy's 
knows. I was like, <laughs> I told him, I said, man, your, your story can't end like this. I can't sit here and watch this be your last chapter. And, uh, you know, so it, it's always a wonder of where these people, you know, end up. Um, thank y'all. Thank y'all for letting me come out. <laughs> So thank you, Jason. Thanks for the amazing message and the amazing words. Um, you're inspiring and you're warm and we appreciate you and what you're doing to help our communities. Now we'll hear a brief message from Eric Gash. Eric Gash is a proud graduate of Hendersonville City Schools. And after winning a basketball state championship with the Bearcats, attended UNC Chapel Hill on a football scholarship where he was a four-year letterman and starting outside linebacker throughout his time as a Tar Heel. Eric was commissioned as a pastor in 2005 and has served a 32-month church planting mission in St. Lucia before moving back home to Hendersonville, where he is the lead pastor of the Speak Life Community Church. In 2014, Eric was named head coach of the Hendersonville High School football team, the first African-American to serve in that position in Henderson County, and only the second in Western North Carolina since the end of the segregation era. After ascending to athletic director and assistant principal, Eric took on the principalship of his childhood alma mater, Bruce Drysdale Elementary in January, 2020, and he serves in that position today. Eric also sits on the board for the Henderson County Community Foundation and serves as a volunteer chaplain with the Henderson City Police, Hendersonville City Police. Eric, we're excited to hear from you. Hi, uh, you know, when I think of uh, folks who are dealing um, with addiction, um, I think that we sometimes have a tendency to look past them and uh, not give them the benefit of their humanity. You know, I'm reminded when we're in the mission field in St. Lucia, how we would go to a homeless shelter every uh, Thursday night and we take our projector and our computer and we bring a movie and um, we'd uh, bring popcorn and pizza and, and drinks and just sit down and talk with them and, and enjoy a movie together. We didn't know them personally. We, we got to know them over the course of time. Um, but, you know, a lot of times these folks were homeless because of um, their addictions, whether it be drug addiction or alcohol or something like that, uh, opioids. Um, but we just wanted to give them a sense of, of humanity. We wanted to sit down and talk with them and just commune with them and make them feel like they were still a part of a community. Uh, and that, that, that rang uh, very true to us and, and it really touched our heart. And we brought our kids along with us and just so they could see um, the humanity uh, in the faces uh, of those who were addicted. And so it's important that we do that. Um, you know, and I'm reminded of a scripture taken from Matthew uh, chapter 25, verses uh, 34 through 36. And it says, the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father and take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked for me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. So that scripture rang true uh, in our hearts and minds when we're going in there just to, to connect with them. And like I said, just to give them a, a sense or feeling um, of humanity, give them the benefit of their humanity. And that's something that we have a tendency uh, to lose. And it's important that we don't lose that, um, that we continue to treat people with dignity, honor, and respect. In other words, treat them as we uh, would like to be treated. So it's important for me and my family that we that we do that. And we set that example for, for folks. And I'd encourage you to do the same. Um, don't turn a blind eye. Um, we're all just uh, maybe one paycheck away, one, um, one heartbeat away from, from being in a similar position. And so make sure we love folks as we want to be loved. We treat others as we want to be treated uh, and give them the benefit of their uh, humanity. God bless you. Eric, thank you so much for taking time to speak to us tonight and for your kind words. 
Um, I don't think we can all be reminded enough about kindness and humanity and dignity. And um, we just really appreciate you coming on and saying a few words with us. So our final speaker for tonight, we will hear from Julie Honeycutt. Julie has worked in the nonprofit world for over 20 years and has been the director of Hope Coalition since 2014. In 2010, after losing her 20-year-old daughter to an opioid overdose, she and her husband founded Anna's Hope, a fund dedicated to raising awareness about prescription drug misuse. Since then, she has been active both locally and regionally, appearing on multiple news shows, speaking at addiction conferences, civic, political, and social clubs, sharing a story of hope while emphasizing the dangers of substance misuse. Julie has a BS in psychology from NC State University, a certificate of nonprofit management from Duke University, and a certificate in fundraising management from Indiana University. She is a graduate of CADCA's National Coalition Academy and has been, a, been an, an, an appointee to the Juvenile Crime Prevention Council. We're excited to hear from you, Julie. My name is Julie Honeycutt. I'm the director of Hope Coalition. 12 years ago this week, we lost our 20-year-old daughter, Anna, to an opiate overdose. It just seems like yesterday. Um, it's really hard to even talk about sometimes because she was such a young, beautiful, vibrant human being. And she was lost um, in her addiction to opiates that she became addicted to um, pretty innocently through a routine wisdom tooth extraction and then a, a tonsillectomy. So we battled to try to save her um for at least two years in and out of rehabs and detoxes intensive outpatient anything we could do to try to help her but the strength of the opiates were super super strong obviously stronger than her human will and so we no longer have her here with us but one thing i do know uh, and and I, I believe with all my heart it is that if naloxone had been available the day that she did overdose and it had been administered, she may have been with us today. I think it's so important to know that naloxone saves lives and gives people another chance. And it's also so important to know that sometimes people need lots of chances. It's not just the one time, it could be many times. But I believe also with all my heart, that as long as there's breath, there's hope. And you never know when it may be that one time. A few years ago, we did a billboard with Anna's picture from high school, and it said that naloxone may have saved her. That was hard for me to drive by many, many times a week and see, but I knew that if we could get that word out about naloxone, that we could save lives. So I believe that naloxone should be in every household. I believe that naloxone should be with everyone. I carry it in my car. I think it needs to be in every store. It needs to be in every school. We need to have it available in every home because lives are worth saving. And you never know when that person may be ready to seek recovery. Thank you. Julie, thank you so much for taking time to speak with us today, for sharing your personal story about Anna and for sharing your message of hope and for your tireless leadership in Henderson County. You are truly a powerful example among prevention leaders. So we are so thankful tonight to all of our speaker, speakers. They are truly inspiring and doing incredible things in our communities. Uh, I am in awe always of the amazing speakers um, and the amazing work that you're all doing. Uh, we will now view the virtual reality simulation portion of this event. So our partner Walmart has invested in training in their associates, which includes this academy as well as the use of virtual reality. 
The VR program was specifically developed as a tool for training that was designed to help replicate unique training situations that are hard to replicate in the classroom, such as um, teaching associates, um, uh, providing their associates Black Friday trainings and simulations. So this technology that they had led to the development of non-retail training, such as the VR training that we will see right now. So let's take a moment to view this training. Thank you. Dude, guess what I just wiped for my grandma? What? Don't people get strung out on this stuff? Yeah. That's the point. These two industrious young gentlemen have stolen opioid medication for recreational use. Oxycodone, hydrocodone, fentanyl, and heroin are a group of chemicals referred to as opioids. The first three may be prescribed by a medical professional to treat pain, but they can be addictive and deadly especially if not taken as directed. Heroin has no legitimate medical purpose. Opioid overdose is the current leading cause of death for people under 55. True or false? More than half of Americans have been affected by opioids. Correct. Over 70,000 people died of opioid overdose in the United States in 2017. And millions more were impacted through overdose or misuse. That means that if you have not been directly affected by opioids, someone you know likely has. But not every overdose needs to end in death. Today we're going to teach you to spot the signs of an overdose and administer naloxone, a life-saving medication. Hey, you okay, dude? You don't look so good. Opioid overdoses will slow or stop your breathing. This reduces the amount of oxygen in your body, resulting in pale or clammy skin. The pupils will constrict until they are the size of a pin. The lack of oxygen can cause the fingers and sometimes lips to turn blue, gray, or purple, depending on the person's skin tone. Dude, your breathing is weird. It's too slow. A very serious side effect of opioids is depressed breathing. During an overdose, their breathing will become shallow, erratic, or stop entirely. Oh, Jay. Jay. Jay, Jay. Wake up, man. Wake up or I'm calling the cops. John. Hey, I'm not playing with you. Dude, are you breathing? Dude, you're not breathing. Jonathan. Loss of consciousness is the final tell of an overdose. If you suspect someone is passing out because of an overdose, 
you should scream their name and try to wake them to see if they will respond. As with any emergency, the first thing you should do is call 911. Yeah, hello. Um, yeah, my, I need help. Naloxone is a life-saving medication that can reverse opioid overdose and restore breathing. There are several types of naloxone available, and all of them provide a life-saving medication in the event of an opioid overdose. In the example today, you'll see the nasal spray Narcan administered. If you happen to have the injectable form, make sure to hold the needle straight and inject it into a muscle, like the shoulder or the upper thigh. First, peel back the packaging to remove the device. The device has a plunger and a nozzle. Hold the device with your thumb on the plunger and two fingers on the nozzle. Be careful not to accidentally spray the naloxone before you are ready. The device only has one dose, so don't test it out. Put the device right up their nostril until your fingers are touching their nose. Press firmly on the plunger to release the dose of naloxone. Come on, buddy. Wake up. Come on, man, wake up. After you administer naloxone, place them in the recovery position and wait for help. The person who overdosed needs immediate medical care. You should stay with them until help arrives in case they lose consciousness again. Another dose may be necessary. There you go. There you go. All right, that's it. Welcome back. Great job. When people think of overdose, they usually think of recreational opioid use like we saw here. This is a stereotype. And unfortunately, there are many situations that lead to accidental overdose. Let's take a look at other situations that can lead to accidental overdose. Mom? 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 Mom, wake up. Mom? Again. My mother is blacked out. I think she's had a heart attack. Send an ambulance. Please stay calm. I'm going to check her vitals. What's her name? Blanche. Blanche, I'm here to help you, okay? Is that hers? I'm gonna check her for an overdose. She's got a pulse, but her breathing is slow. Let's check her pupils. All right, stay with me. Uh-oh, they're constricted. With this medication, this may be an overdose. Let's administer naloxone. All right, Blanche, stick with me, okay? One second. All right, I'm just gonna go right up here. The patient took too much of her prescribed medication. She forgot that she took her medication before breakfast and took another dose after breakfast in the event that this had been a heart attack. Naloxone wouldn't have been able to treat the heart attack, but it would generally be fine to administer to her without serious complications. Talk to your healthcare provider or check the package insert for possible side effects and additional information. All right, Eugene, got your stuff. Oh no. (sighs) 
Eugene took an old opioid medication that he had previously been prescribed for pain. Usually this wouldn't cause an overdose, but he's taking a new benzodiazepine medication. When opioids and benzodiazepines mix, the results can be deadly. Always check with your doctor or pharmacist before taking any medication, just in case there will be a negative interaction with your other medications. Opioid overdose can happen to anyone. You can overdose from opioids even when taking a prescription exactly as your doctor prescribed, which is exactly what happened to me. All right, hotshot. I hope you're paying attention. It's your time to shine. Select the things you should look for when you suspect an opioid overdose. Now, let's review how to administer naloxone. Correct. You have to remove the device from its packaging. It will not do you a lot of good otherwise. Correct. That's how you hold the device. That's correct. You did it. You saved my life. Thank you for knowing what to do in the event of an opioid overdose. Accidental overdose can happen to anyone taking opioids, whether recreationally or even as directed by a doctor. This information can save a life. Opioid misuse is a national epidemic and accidental overdose can happen to anyone taking opioids. It takes an entire community to keep all our members safe from overdose. If you or someone you care about is taking opioids for any reason, consider getting naloxone at your local pharmacy and keeping it on you at all times. No prescription is required and it could save your life or the life of someone you care about. So thank you so much to the Walmart team for developing this powerful tool. We're so excited to work with you to connect this to community members. Uh, and thank you so much for hosting us and to all of the speakers here today and participants who have taken time out to be part of this event. At this point, we would typically get some very valuable feedback from you all on how to best use this technology in their communities. However, we're through the hour, actually a little bit over the hour, and I really wanna be respectful of your time. So please look out for us to reach out to you and follow up with you. We really want your input and we'll be following up with you to get that shortly. Again, we wanna say thank you to all the speakers. Thank you to our co-hosts, the Hope Coalition, and to Walmart and to everyone who has attended today. We will conclude the, the webinar and I wish you all a great rest of the week. Thank you.